Welcome back, everybody. I hope you got your coffee and you're ready to sink into this opening presenter. The time has come. We're going to begin our programming with an event that is always a crowd favorite, the Fraser Mustard Lecture, this year with Dr. Paige Church. This is presented with thanks to our platinum sponsor, Simon Fraser University. And, you know, typically the keynote speaker address um, speaks to honors the foundational work of Dr. Mustard in the intersection of biological and social sciences and early childhood development. This next hour will highlight the need to change the culture of medicine to respect and awareness of stigma. Dr. Paige Church is, as I mentioned in our opening comments today, phenomenal. She has done phenomenal things uh, in her career so far, named one of Canada's most powerful women by the Executive Network. She's Sunnybrook's own. Uh, she's drawing on her background of neonatal perinatal medicine and developmental behavioral pediatrics and lived and experienced insights. Dr. Church is gonna share her experience with ableism in medicine, both from the perspective of a provider and as a user of the healthcare system and discuss her work, highlighting the need to change the culture of medicine to one of respect and awareness of stigma. Her talk is called Failure of Imagination, Ableism in Medicine. Today, this, opening keynote is going to be moderated and shared by Dr. James Reynolds, who is the Chief Scientific Officer of Kids Brain Health Network. He is a professor in the Department of Biomedical and Molecular Sciences and at the Center uh, uh, for Neurosciences at Queen's University. So over to you, James. Thanks very much, Jody. So before we begin, I just wanted to say uh, a couple of words about the origin of this of this lectureship, and, and particularly the, the individual that it's named for. Fraser Mustard was a leader in Canada in recognizing the impact of socioeconomic determinants on human health and development. He was an early champion of the importance of early childhood and the role of communities in promoting healthy development, including advocating for national early childhood development programs. A co-founder of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, companion of the Order of Canada, the highest level of that recognition, and an inductee into the Canadian Medical Hall of Fame, Dr. Mustard's influence on our field continues to be felt today. Since 2011, KBHN has hosted the Fraser Mustard Lecture at its annual conference in honor of Dr. Mustard's legacy. This year, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Paige Church as the 2021 Fraser Mustard Lecturer. Dr. Church is an accomplished clinician. She's a neonatologist and behavioral pediatrician and medical director of the neonatal follow-up clinic at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center in Toronto. As Jody just mentioned, Dr. Church was named one of Canada's most powerful women by the Women's Executive Network, an award that recognizes outstanding women across Canada who advocate for workforce diversity and inspire tomorrow's leaders. I think given the uh, theme of our, of our conference today, I can't think of anyone better than Dr. Church to give this opening address. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Paige Church to present the 2021 Fraser Mustard Lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for this incredible honor to have uh, this opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, Fraser Mustard has long been a hero of mine, so this was a huge opportunity for me. Thank you. So I titled this talk, Failure of Imagination, and this is really one journey of mine as a patient and as a physician. So uh, my disclosure is only that um, I'm afraid that you're going to want to send me back after you've heard this. Um, the imposter syndrome starts to start to be a big anxiety. So discrimination results when people in one group fail to imagine that people in some other group lead lives as rich and complex as their own. Everyone from literary theorists to bioethicists to obstetricians and genetic counselors are susceptible to such failures of imagination. And what I hope this talk can do for you today is to share with you how I myself failed to imagine my own life, let alone those of my patients. So our goals today are going to be just briefly to review the historical context of medicine and disability, 
identify the bias that exists in medicine, review how this bias can interfere with care, and review how uh, to avoid this bias from interfering with the care we deliver. But I think to start, let me provide a bit of context. This is from my medical chart. Uh, it says I'm 45, I'd like to have that frozen in time. Let's just leave it at that. Um, 45 year old woman, lipomyelomeningocele, neurogenic bladder requiring clean intermittent catheter, neurogenic bowel, status post and appendicose apostomy, tethered cord syndrome, status post detethering complicated by meningitis, Arnold Chiari malformation, multiple orthopedic procedures, lower extremity weakness. I have had 11 surgeries to date. But instead of this list, this is how I see myself and this is how I prefer to be seen as a wife to my lovely and wonderful husband, uh, a mother to my spunky little daughter. Uh, I am a daughter to my parents, a sister to my sister and brother. I hope a good friend and I also hope most days a good doctor. I have also had the blessing of being told or being termed as being an enhanced patient. And what that means I, I came to learn is that as the daughter and granddaughter of physicians, I had some degree of an insider's perspective on the system of medicine. I didn't understand all of it, but I had my father there to navigate for me a myriad of care providers and a system and to make sure it all worked for me. This is one of my favorite pictures of me and my father. Um, this was on New Year's Eve shortly before I was readmitted to the hospital, but in that brief moment, I was in the safest place I could ever be with him. This is another favorite photo. My mother was told when I was first born and sent home that I wouldn't walk or crawl. And when these prognostications were offered, uh, no one countered them with any hopeful things that could happen. Uh, and this was the day I started to defy their expectations. Over the course of my childhood, my father sought advice from colleagues, and he went everywhere from the military medical system that he was in at the time to the private sector. And I had that luxury of his medical background to filter through all of this and decide on the best courses of treatment. It was a luxury I now see, but also a huge source of stress for him. And I understand that all the better now that I am a physician myself and a parent myself. But what it did do is it provided me with individualized care and an early perception that if something wasn't working, we could look to be fixing it and it would be fixed either through surgical means or medical means. And with this background, my parents, as all parents will do, continually looked for any experts that they could find for someone to help. And it was here that I landed at Boston Children's Hospital for many years of surgery, trying to fix various problems that were arising. But with time, unfixable things began to demonstrate that they couldn't be fixed and they were demonstrating that they were worsening, such as neurogenic bladder and bowel. Now understood to be part of the syndrome of tethered cord syndrome, but at the time not understood. And so I presented at appointment after appointment, looking for an answer and a cure. And ultimately these appointments started to end with garish options that were offered uh, things like a physician who just, I don't know if he got fed up with us, but he just sort of said, well, the only answer is that I can cut your spine uh, or your vertebral bodies, and then with that, your spine will fit. That is a surgical option that is never offered in the standard of care anywhere in North America. Or comments that were really damaging, things that were said to my parents that were said included, it's all in her head, there's nothing wrong. And so what I learned was to avoid asking for any solutions because I was afraid that I was going to be misinterpreted as mentally unsound or that I was making up problems. And I was frightened, frankly, by what I was hearing were the options. And quietly, I realized that I had to get inside the system. I could no longer just rely on my father. I loved him, but I knew he wouldn't be there forever. And I also knew that there were things I just didn't understand that just didn't seem like they were being navigated effectively. Uh, and so I went to medical school and I said, this is how I'm going to get in there. I'm going to get in there myself. And what I learned in medical school finally is that there are rules and there is a culture in medicine. And it, you know, I had sort of a vague idea of it, but certainly in medical school, I came to understand it much more clearly. Um, and what I understood was that these rules aren't really written down. They're not in a formal lecture but they were very clear and they became more and more clear as you went through school. 
And one of the big ones that I learned that became very clear to me as a medical student and then as a resident was that there is this perception that the more complicated the medical problem list, the more impacted the quality of life must be. It was said with every groan of a complicated admission when we would get a child who needed to be admitted and everybody sort of fought over who was going to take that one. Every attempt to avoid doing those discharge summaries. And I came to understand over the years that the comments of dismissal I had heard now made much more sense. I myself was complicated and I had problems that were extending into multiple systems of care and there was no system for this, but there also was no understanding of this. But to identify as complicated also carried the burden of having people then think that somehow my quality of life was compromised. And it was years later, as I started to explore this concept of the attitude towards problems like mine in the world of medicine, and I found articles like this one from 1979, which I realize is very old, but it sort of articulates the, the background or the tone of medicine. And what it wrote about was defining normal rubbish as things that couldn't be fixed or that the individual wouldn't fix. So things like my condition of spina bifida and or mental health or addiction, these were all the dregs of the medical community. Far preferable are things that are easily fixed with antibiotics, a cast, a surgery, and not these conditions that are not fixable. And I came to understand that ableism is rampant, and I'm not even sure I like the term, but that is the term that's been used. Ableism is rampant in medicine, and it is this culture of ableism. Ableism is defined as a network of beliefs, processes, and practices that produces a particular kind of self and body that is projected as the perfect, species typical, and therefore essential and fully human. Disability then is cast as some diminished state of being human. And the presence of this bias within medicine is hugely impactful. It is us in medicine that are often the first individuals who are going to convey uh, a diagnosis and introduce that diagnosis that may be associated with a disability. Further to that, there is this ongoing dance that will happen between the individual and the medical sector. And that dance is more often going to happen if that individual has a disability. And with this, we in medicine have the power and the opportunity to create perception around disability and conditions that may be associated with a disability. And to sort of step back a little bit to understand why we have this incredible power or how this power is yielded, I think it's important to look at this idea of this scientific theory of how language shapes realities and how we learn um, literacy. And that is this idea of the relational frame theory. This theory describes how the human brain learns language and the human brain has this innate ability to form associations between concepts. And these associations are bi-directional and unintentional. And it is this unintentional background that is linked, to, believed to be linked to some degree of psychopathology. And let me expand a little bit. So if I expand on this tendency to, for brains to make associations, look at the words that have been used over the years in the medical literature to describe disabling conditions. Severe, poor, bad, and in older times, but not outside of my lifetime, cripple, wheelchair bound. When a provider is introducing the concept of a condition that is associated with a disability and they say, you have a risk of this disability, there's no way that those two words are now linked based on how our brains take in language, but there's no way that that condition has anything other than a negative attribute because I don't know any risk that comes with a positive reward. Um, so it's important when we think about that, that we think about how we use our words when we talk about disability. And this creep of our bias into medicine has been described as a risk, and I use that word appropriately, in medicine through microethics. And microethics are the brief moments. They're the moments that happen every second that we're interacting with a patient. And it is woven into those microethical moments is language and the language we use. And the vernacular in medicine suggests that we have a bias um, when we talk about these conditions and we use words like severe and poor and bad and risk. Further to that, there is evidence that, percept that, this, that our perceptions in medicine are there and that they do shape our care. 
This is a more recent paper from over 700 physicians that were surveyed, family doctors mostly in obstetrics and gynecologists, and most reported that disability was indeed associated with a worse quality of life than the life without a disability. But still almost half felt that they were still capable of providing some the same quality of care. And more recently, anyone who has been awake and alert for the last 20 months, um, the COVID pandemic, this has been a frequent discussion that's come up and it has not been limited to Canada, it's been in the US, it's been all over the world, is this idea of rationing care and deciding as we hit these pandemics or these waves and the waves crest, who gets care and who doesn't. Um, and disability and disabling conditions are often on the list of things that are not going to be considered um, those that would be given full care if they had to make a choice. Uh, for anyone who lives with a disability, that is haunting. And what I learned about this perspective and this bias in medicine, and as I learned about it, I was also grappling with my own demons. Uh, I recognize that my challenges are not entirely visible. Many of those who knew the thread of my medical story immediately presumed that somehow I was unaffected or quote unquote spared, um, and I wasn't, and I chose not to clarify that in any way, shape or form. And it is this background and knowing this perspective and the perception of me as a patient and as a physician that I just chose to pretend kind of like this duck looking relatively calm on the surface and frantically paddling beneath the waterline. I made choices that are so maladaptive and yet at the time seemed so clear in my head, I chose to not eat or drink all day at work on the wards because I couldn't risk any problems with having to use the bathroom at an un, uh, unscheduled or an unopportune time. Uh, somehow, however, these choices were far easier to live with and that says a lot it was easier to live with not eating or drinking than it was to be forthright and acknowledge that the condition I had um, was, was real and it was present and it was affecting my day-to-day -day life because I really didn't want to be viewed in any way, shape or form as anything different than what my colleagues perceived me to be. On off days, I became the queen of excuses. Uh, I made sure my pager was always on vibrate so that no one could hear it, but I could get up like it had gone off and leave the room emergently. Um, I never had to admit to anyone what I was doing or where I was going if I did it that way. Um, and this is how I lived. I lived this sort of this alternative life that nobody really knew what was going on. Um, and it was all just to cover up what I thought wouldn't be tolerable or accepted in my field. And it was all working, or so I kind of thought. I thought I had it all pulled together tightly until right before Christmas one year, when I was asked to provide consultation on a pregnancy that was notable for a twin gestation. And the pregnancy was currently at 23 weeks. And the complicating issue was that one twin had been found to have a lipomyelomeningocele, the same type of spina bifida that I have. And the parents were asking for selective termination or to end the pregnancy for this affected child. Different hospitals handle these situations differently, but at this institution, they had a policy that they had to have an interdisciplinary team consult with the families and all the providers, and then the providers would weigh in on whether or not the institution could offer this, um, this practice. At this point in my career, I was still fairly closeted. I hadn't been really open about what was going on. Um, but with this case and with this challenge, I recognized that I needed to provide that disclosure in order to um, demonstrate or to acknowledge that I lacked equipoise. Um, given the time of year, I tried to step out of it. I tried to say I'm not available. That didn't work. So then finally, I basically had to um, disclose to my colleagues, and there were probably 20 of us on the email, that this was going to be tricky because I had the same condition. And I honestly thought that was going to get me off the hook. And I sort of was like, OK, back to having fun. I had the day off. Uh, and then. Um, they emailed back and said, yeah, but it's the 23rd and we don't have anyone else. So we're going to disclose this to the family. And if you will come, we need you to come. So I went um, and I made sure I like showered and did my hair really, really well. But then I went and what I initially offered with the family was that uh, I made sure that they had heard that I had the same condition. And then I was very quick to point out the spina bifida or a neural tube defect as it's sometimes called is like a snowflake. And there, there are no two cases that are the same. And then I offered what I said would be generalized expectations 
and that those would include the possibility of a neurogenic bladder or bowel, as well as the possibility of lower extremity weakness. I reviewed that most children would go to a mainstream classroom, but that some may need extra support for learning. And the family acknowledged this and, and heard everything I had to say over the hour that I was with them. And then um, I wrote uh, my piece for the institution, but ultimately what ended up happening for this family is that they were given the opportunity to selectively reduce the pregnancy or terminate that one fetus at 34 weeks. And for me, this consult was really akin to sort of hitting a brick wall. I struggled with information that I had provided. I really thought a lot about it. What had I said? Had I been too optimistic? Or more likely, had I been too pessimistic? Had I used the correct words? Well, I knew that they know that I had the condition. Had I been brave enough to say that my life was actually really nice? And I knew the answer. I knew the answer for sure. And the answer was, no, I hadn't done that. I had stayed hidden behind the safety of my white coat. And I had stayed hidden behind the protective shield of my objectivity or my attempt at being a doctor. And I think for me as a provider, as a person, this was the biggest professional challenge I had ever faced. I was terrified of exploring the ambiguity I felt, but I also knew I couldn't avoid it any further. So I went back to two women who I had sort of avoided in my career, but also I had seen as pivotal and I always had kept their emails around. Adrian Ash is the woman on the left. She is an ethicist and she happens to be blind and a vocal disability rights advocate. And then Ellen Perrin on the right was my mentor in developmental peds and a huge advocate for championing, championing alternative perspectives. These women were brave enough to ask me some hard questions and others hard questions and never apologized for questioning the status quo. They were also incredibly kind to me and they saw the conflict that I was struggling with and they offered only their support and perspective. And it was through this that I realized that I was failing to imagine what for so many of my patients their lives were, just as others had failed to do so with me. I learned that my medical ed education to date had been one without any capacity for imagination. And if, I was the, if it was the lens that I continued to look through, I too would fail to imagine myself. And yet I knew in my soul that as an individual, my life was far richer than the medical list could imagine it to be. And with each thing I read and I started reading everything they gave me and then I bounced from what they read to the references and then I read the references, I bounced from one thing to another and I spent a lot of time with Andrew Solomon. This is an incredible man who has a learning disability um, and is also uh, gay and is a gay man raising children. His writings are very provocative and fascinating and I recommend Far From the Tree for anyone. This quote was on his experience researching families characteristics characterized by being different. So a family much like mine. Having always imagined myself in a fairly slim minority, I suddenly saw that I was in vast company. Differences unite us. While each of us, each of these ex experiences can isolate those who are affected, together they compose an aggregate of millions whose struggles connect them profoundly. The exceptional is ubiquitous. To be entirely typical is rare in a lonely state. And I thought that was so interesting because I was so used to being alone. And then I also started researching and learning more and more about the incredible individuals who worked for the Americans with Disabilities Act and who were showcased so nicely in this documentary, Crip Camp, um, or the documentary from Andrew's book, Far From the Tree, and then also Ben Matlin in his book, Sickness and in Health, what I found in this community of individuals living with a spectrum of conditions, some visible and some not, but rather than cowering to what was missing or impaired, they were celebrating everything about them that was right. And that was such a novel perspective to me. And then from that, I found my own voice and a perspective that I could articulate. This was an editorial I wrote for JAMA. I acknowledge that I do not have the right answer and I feel differently day to day, sometimes hour to hour about my condition. But I have also learned that medicine oversimplifies the discussion of disability. This simplification sterilizes disability, making black and white discussions much easier. Disability, capable of, tremend capable of tremendous opportunity, is not simple. Like most things in life and medicine, disability is sharp, painful, humbling, 
as well as tremendous, giving, and awe-inspiring. It is human. It is not easily distilled to an all-or-none discussion. Medicine sets the tone for this discussion and to date has done a miserable job. I also learned as a patient that I had to stop looking for a fix, that I had to accept that some things may not be fixable and that the maladaptive strategies that I was using were also no longer working. So I had to stop pretending that things didn't exist because it would only get worse from then on. So I learned to dig in. I learned to carve out time, which anyone who practices medicine or anyone, frankly, anywhere, time is precious. And I learned to just start getting up earlier. I had to make time for exercising, time for stretching, times for therapy, realizing that nobody was going to make that time for me unless I made it for myself. And I readjusted my goals, not to think about whether or not I could be fixed per se, but rather to capitalize on what was working and how to keep it going. And I channeled this learning into also trying to change the landscape and the culture within my field. Um, these are guidelines that we wrote recently for the Spina Bifida Association on counseling a parent whose pregnancy is affected by a child with spina bifida, underscoring that information that we would share would be critical for families to make decisions and that different cultures would perceive this information differently. And as a result, consultations, which once had been prescriptive and formulaic, should be individualized and collaborative, and that neutral, not value-based language should be used. So getting rid of words like risk and saying instead, like, I have important news. This is going to have a significant impact on your family. That says the same thing as your child has a risk of spina bifida, or your child has, um, we have bad news or something to talk about. Because it's not for us to say if it's good or bad, it's for the families to decide what they perceive that life to be. And with this, I also had the opportunity to further share and learn from my colleagues through forums with medical students on being a physician with a disability in New England Journal, through podcasts, uh, sharing one story and then listening to many others, and then through White Coat Black Art with Brian Goldman. What I learned with each step further out into the open is that while it was painful and intimidating to share my story, it made younger junior doctors coming along behind me have some precedence so that maybe they could be less ashamed and feel less stigmatized than I had. So what's the point? That's a great question. That's what I asked myself several times as I made these slides. I think the points are similar takeaways, regardless of whether you're a family member or a patient or a provider, and that my insight for either or and both is based on life lived and experience as both. So for providers, my takeaways are these. Please acknowledge the tendency in medicine for ableism and recognize that all conditions can't be fixed. But I would say not all conditions should be fixed. That is okay. Living well matters as much to most individuals as being fixed. Please remember that patients seek care, not judgment. That is so important and that they generally seek help when something is deeply affecting their body, mind, or soul. Drill down to what it is that is getting them there and give them the great care that they are entitled to. And own your mistakes and learn from them. You are human and patients know that. And for my colleagues and my, my peeps in the patient world, uh, this is my point. As a lifelong patient in the healthcare system, not all conditions can be fixed, and quite frankly, not all conditions should be fixed. I've come to be incredibly grateful that my spina bifida was never erased. Um, I would say teach your provider to focus on function rather than being fixed. Sometimes providers don't have that mindset, but it, it, great ones can be taught. I think it's also important to say, expect three things at any visit. To show up and expect everything to be fixed is really, really hard, and it is unrealistic. Um, and it sets you up for a lot of disappointment. And lastly, forgive mistakes. Most providers are human and they are doing their best and whatever, whatever that best is for them. And for anyone out there living with a condition that may or may not be overt, I loved this quote that I have learned over many years. Remember, you weren't the one who made you ashamed, but you are the one who can make you proud. That's from Laura Hershey. So a huge thank you for this invitation. That is my email. I'm sure it's available elsewhere if you have any questions. And if there is time, I would love to also say a thank you to my community um, with a brief video that was made last month for spina bifida awareness. 
I will tell you that the lyrics and the singing is by one of um, my colleagues who has fine bifida. If we could have the video, that'd be Maybe I'm young, but I'm not dumb. I could see what's going on. People talking around me, saying I'll never be long. But the scars I've always lived with, and I overcome every day, make me want to say that I am like a soldier, so brave, fierce, and strong. Since I was a baby, just a kid. Well, Paige, I want to first thank you very much for, for sharing your story in, in such an, an open and honest way. And, and I know that your message touched everyone who's, who's listening. And I especially think uh, it, will, it will have resonated with the, the families and their experience. Um, so I, uh, we have some, uh, a good amount of time for some, some questions and discussion. Uh, we, there is a, a Q and A section in in the chat, and I will try my best to monitor it. And I see a, a couple of questions posted there, uh, but I, I, since I've got the the podium, I, I'm going to uh, take the opportunity to, to get in first because the, the your message uh, there are so many uh, important components to it. Um, but but one I, I we have tried to uh, focus on in. And, and allow our families to express is, is, this, is this idea that not everything is wrong uh, and that we don't we don't we don't see uh, kids uh, as what they are children um, 
we see them and we as a society, and it's very hard not uh, to, to get away from this, to see them as the disability rather than what, what they are as, as, as children. How, how should we frame that message? Because this is something I, I think we all could continue to learn about. How, how do we help communicate the, the fact that these are, these, are, these are people with strengths and ambitions and uh, we should be looking at that first? That's a great question. Um, I, I think you know what I learned over the many years is the most important thing is that most of the children and, and anyone I know, the medical problem or the medical issues are on the sidelines and really what they want to do is live and get into living. And so um, how do we get them back out and living? And so that's what I see the focus being is on the fun you know, for children. There's the F words from Canchild, fun, fitness, friends, family, future. I'm always forgetting one. Uh, but, you know, that's the emphasis is what do we do to get them back to that? Um, and, and then I think the other key thing is, is really, and it's like fingernails down a chalkboard to me now that I can appreciate the impact of language, is really neutralizing our language. Um, and this is something I, I'm constantly nagging my fellows in neonatology about. You know, I have important news. I don't have bad news. I have important news. This head ultrasound has an injury that may be associated with cerebral palsy. Let's talk about what that looks like. Rather than I have, you know, I have bad news or this head ultrasound has the risk of this. Because I know people with cerebral palsy who are far more functional than anybody I know without it. So for me to say that cerebral palsy is the defining characteristic of who they are is, is wrong. Um, but it's a, it's a steep hill in medicine. And I will tell you that I have been uh, criticized by my colleagues uh, for that approach and for being too vague or too optimistic. You know, the list goes on and on. And that really was the beginnings of where I just felt like I couldn't sit silent anymore. And I needed to come out of the closet myself in order to offer my background to say, well, if I'm not a risk, then why are they a risk? Um, so, uh, you know, that's what I hope. And I, I hope it becomes more and more widespread. I think the movement is starting and families and individuals are demanding it now. So um, hopefully it will continue to, to go forward. So I think that, that maybe partially addresses the first question uh, that came from Dr. Darcy Failings. And she asked, can you tell us how your experience that you shared with us has impacted on how you work with families and children in your neonatal intensive care unit. And I, I think yeah. I probably would add not just the families, but uh, but your colleagues as well. Yeah, it's it's still a bit intimidating, and thank you, Darcy. She's a dear friend and mentor. Um, it is still very intimidating to to push back on the institution and, and, and sort of demand that this is the way we should be speaking about this. Um, but then I think about my mom and my dad and and what they went through and and. I go back to saying, this is the way it should be. This is the way it has to be. All of my friends in the hospital, we aren't risks. We are great people that we're doing really fun things and living and playing and laughing. And that's what we want to be known for, not you know, the thing that we might be in the hospital for. That's just a, a brief moment. We want to get back out into the life and have some fun. So here's, a, uh, I think, a, a challenging question that uh, has come from uh, Pascal Gagné at, uh, at Health Nexus. Because you talked about uh, uh, owning mistakes, but uh, Pascal's question is related to uh, what would you say about service providers not owning mistakes due to fear of legal re repercussions linked to malpractice? How would you address this to reduce institutional ableism at the system level? Sorry, and what was the question about malpractice? I missed that last part. So uh, it's about service providers not owning mistakes oh, due to yes. legal repercussions linked to malpractice. Yeah. yeah. And how, you know, and how I, do we I, reduce this? I think that's a good question. It's an important question. Um, you know, owning your mistakes is actually uh, something my father taught me when, uh, when I was, before I was in medical school and physicians made mistakes with our care. And, uh, and my father was really respectful and kind about people owning their mistakes. I think it is important, and being a US trained doctor, the fear of malpractice is, is constantly overhead. Um, 
what I have come to do is if I feel like we have done something that was, you know, a lot of mistakes are really around communication. And I think those are fairly simple to own and to say how it's going to be better. How are you going to change the lines of communication to be more effective? Um, and the outcome is often not something that's terribly fraught with risk of malpractice. And I use the word risk intentionally. But there are cases where there is something that may have been wrong and there is the possibility of malpractice. And with those, I do believe very strongly in getting support from you know, the broader institution. Um, I'm quick to call the CMPA with questions about what I can and cannot do. But I think what most families want to hear is, is an acknowledgement that something didn't go the way it was expected to, what your investigation has revealed in terms of what the system did to contribute to that and how you're going to change the system to avoid it from happening again. And when that is done, most families and most uh, individuals will say that that is enough for them, that they feel that they have had their concerns addressed. It's not always going to be the case, um, but if you have the institution and the CMPA also providing guidance, then hopefully you will not step sideways too far. Um, but that's been sort of my practice because it is really irritating as a patient to have someone not own something that's wrong. Um, it makes you lose faith in the provider and the system, and that that also isn't great. Um, and I've had epic mistakes be made with me as a patient, but these are not small things like my cord being partially transected by a surgeon who didn't understand what he was doing. Um, but it's important to recognize, I don't think he was doing anything intentionally or, or wrong. I think he made a mistake and it was human. And I happened to meet him when I was in medical school years later and he almost started crying with his apology. And it broke my heart to think that he had lived with that kind of grief for so long. Um, because yeah, it was, it was, it was an epic misstep, but, um, I have no question that he surgical technique changed and he improved his care. So I did look in the, uh, in the, in the chat. So when, while I, while I do this, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, ask one of the other questions that I, that I wrote down listening to you. I, I don't think you use the, the word, uh, overtly, but it's, it's something that kids and with neurodevelopmental disabilities and their families struggle with and that's the stigma associated with simply having a disability uh, and and wanting to keep wanting to to, to to keep to keep it secret as as you alluded to because they they they're, they're not understood or accepted by by their peers their neighbors even sometimes their, their friends uh, this is I mean, you showed incredible courage uh, in 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 the actions that, that you take. How how would you advise families who who, who face this on a daily basis? Uh, what's what's their best course of action? That's a great question, and I, I think for every individual, it is highly unique and and specific to them and their story. But um, you know. It is this horrible stigma that sits over us. And, and even today, um, you know, there are moments that I regret writing the JAMA piece and having it sort of, it can be used either as a positive or, or sometimes it can be used in a stigmatizing way today. Um, I would say that, you know, the most important thing is, is the climate and the culture. You just have to feel it and feel what's right. Um, I was taught as a little girl to keep everything very quiet, not to share anything. Um, my parents were very worried about the climate and what would happen if, if it was too overtly known. Um, I am hoping that in coming out and in more and more of these, of these embracing of neurodiversity and all the awesomeness of, of all the differences that we bring to the table, that the culture will change and it will become just sort of like a, yeah, all right, well, so that's next. Um, when I met my husband, um, and I, you know, had this big moment of disclosure where I came out of the closet to him and I told him about my medical condition. Uh, he sort of shrugged, but, and he was like, yeah, that's not a big deal. My mom taught at Holland Bloorview. Um, it was Bloorview at the time. And so he'd grown up hanging out at Bloorview with all of these children that his mom taught. And so to him, they were just different kids than he knew. They weren't different for any other reason. They just were at a different school. Um, and so he really saw it as nothing. And I hope that more and more that will become the attitude of children towards each other is just, okay, next, um, you know, I have curly hair uh, and have it just be a normal event. It, it's going to take time. And I hope that more and more people feeling comfortable 
speaking out and actually articulating that that there's greatness in that diversity. Um, you know, Temple Grandin used to say that without people like Temple, the world would be a lot more uh, restricted and a lot less interesting. And, and I agree with her. I think the greatness in the tapestry of neurodiversity needs to be embraced. But I would be cautious if it doesn't feel right or if the child doesn't feel that it's right, then I would respect that and I would let them have time to come to it on their own. It doesn't feel good to have someone out you when you're not ready to be outed. Um, and I think the other big thing, and I've talked a lot about this with our parents in the clinic, is it, it starts with the family. You know, I was lucky. My family was so supportive and loving and uh, sometimes strict, but it, it from that, then everything starts. Sorry. That's okay. This is the joy yeah, yeah, of Yeah, absolutely. And you can't meet yourself, can you? Sorry. Not at all. Uh, I mean, I've been looking at the. Some people are, are more uh, adept at social media than I. They can make them multitask and look at what other. Because there are there are comments in the in the chat that I hope you get a chance to to see uh, because you you clearly have touched uh, and your message is resonated with both uh, families and uh, healthcare professionals. Uh, but something else you 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 brought up because I, I made a note of it because this this our, our current circumstances have, have made this acute. And that uh, the 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 worry, well, actually, it was abject fear of families raising a child with a, with a disability, who, because of the, the disability, would would was be particularly vulnerable to COVID. Uh, but the message was coming that they were likely going to be triaged by the healthcare system as being a low priority. And we know because uh, we we got these messages that the, the fear and anxiety that, that provoked uh, in, in families was 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 severe. I, I think that's going to have a, a long term impact. And I wonder about your 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 thoughts on what that may have done to, to trust in the in the healthcare system. I think that's a great uh, question, and I will tell you that I'm still struggling with that concept of trust. Um, you know, I had to march into the hospital every day during COVID and provide care. And yet I knew that if I ended up getting COVID, somehow my disability might be used as a way to decide if I deserve to get care. Um, that's hard to sit with day to day um, before the vaccine and before there was a bit more assurance that we were protected. Um, and I don't know if I have an answer. I, it's made me very aware of the fact that I need to be elbows out and sharper with uh, my expectations in the healthcare system in a way that maybe naively I hadn't felt before. Um, because I think the messaging, you can't get around it. The messaging was there. The messaging was that we will triage. From a standpoint of an intensivist and understanding when your resources are restricted that you have to sort of triage what you can do with what you have, I could understand it cognitively, but uh, the the determining variables that they were using to decide whether or not someone would receive care to me felt so restricted and so unimaginative um, that, that that was where I was really struggling, was that there was no voice being brought to the table to represent us, to say, what about you know education? What about what they're contributing in general? You know, was I gonna get different treatment as a physician in the healthcare system who had probably acquired COVID at work? Um, I'm not sure. And I, I think there needs to be some reconciling over the next five to 10 years of how, how to go forward, because I share that distrust of people right now. Um, you know, I, I don't know if that's the answer you were supposed to give, but I do. Um, it's hard not to. There is, yeah. Uh, these are, these are difficult questions. Um, and uh, I don't, I don't know if there is a, a good answer. We, I agree with you entirely. We need to find one, and we need to we need to find them before we find ourselves in this situation again, because we know we will, and and we know we can't do things the the same way because so many 
individuals, so many families, so many communities felt felt marginalized and left behind. Yeah, uh, and what was interesting was the vaccine requirements, you know, well, we recognized that we were on the list of what would be considered maybe not worthy of, of full care. We also weren't given priority for the vaccine because we weren't necessarily specifically more vulnerable. So it's also a little bit like that's not a great feeling. Um, to know that if you get it, you're not going to get care, but yet you're not prioritized as someone to prevent it with. So I, I think, you know, I realized that there was a lot of ethical thinking. I realized a lot of this was happening in time that was happening so fast and people were exhausted. And I, I want to give people the grace to say that everyone was doing the best that they could with what they had. And I know that, and remember that's one of my points, everybody is human and they're doing their best. But I think before we march ourselves away from this pandemic and say that we you know, we did or we didn't do whatever was right or wrong. I think that needs to be included in the discussion is how, how did we, how did we get this so wrong with individuals who have disabilities and how do we improve our outreach? You know, there's so much interest in outreach around equity, diversity, and inclusion, but where are people with disabilities in this discussion? We have not been included. Well, I know we could we could uh, talk all day. I have one more question for you in the chat because uh, you've, you've given so much of, of yourself. But this one uh, is from uh, Dr. Sheila Laredo. Uh, and she's asking, what are your thoughts on addressing provider wellness and burnout as it relates to so many of us having extenuating circumstances, including disability, that do not allow us to function at 100%, 100% of the time? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And uh, this is where it's, it's interesting to sort of have that, you know, that long medical list and have all the things that are negative attributes associated with it. Uh, for me, that was what I did to maintain wellness. I've gone every day, I, I mean, partly for therapeutic reasons, I have to go for a long walk, but I found those walks so helpful in helping me to clear my mind and to get to a place where I could go back to work and be recharged. Um, you know, I also have become more militant about carving out time for myself to do the things I needed to do. And that's maintained a little bit of a buffer. Um, certainly the buffer got thinner during COVID because there's no way to sort of say you can't be wherever you're supposed to be because there's Zoom and all these different platforms to connect with people. Um, but I think that that's, that's been really important is just making time for yourself, making time. And I think being outside and in the woods is the most powerful place to be. I think there's a lot of healing that can happen there. I think the other thing though is, and I struggle with this, and my father has taught me this, is to give people grace. You know, when I've gone into work and someone's, you know, just been really short, really frustrated, a parent has sort of blown up or whatever it is, it's sort of like, okay, step out and remember that what am I here for and why, what are they bringing into the discussion? And it might be something I don't know about. Um, and then just sort of walking away and saying, it's not about me, it's about, you know, this is just about getting through this moment and then moving forward. Um, but I think, I mean, provider burnout, we are all burned out. We are all tired. Um, I have worked 40% harder for the last two years than we ever did before. And I thought I was working really hard before that. Um, I, I don't know how we're going to come around from that, but um, I think the first step is taking a little time for ourselves to just go for a walk, clear our head. It takes 15 minutes. It's not like you need to carve out like these big long three hour blocks. Um, I love my sunrise walks. They are my, my, my mental health. Absolutely. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't agree more. So, uh, this, this has been, uh, an amazing start to our, our conference and that's reinforced by the dozens of comments I'm seeing in the, in the, the chat, uh, thanking you for sharing your story and your insights and your message uh, and and i i i saw jody's face with your your closing video um, we we talk about uh giving voice to uh to, to children and and their families uh, and i think you've reminded us that they have that voice and just how powerful it can be when when we listen, so I, I wanted to. Beautiful they are when they're when they're not in the medical system. Like that's life. They're living. They're having fun. That's what they want. They don't want to be in the hospital. They don't want to be with us. Yeah, 
So I am uh, uh, going to turn the, the chair over to Jeff Cordella, who is the uh, chair of the board of directors of the Kids Brain Health Network, to thank you officially on behalf of KBHN for being with us today. Thank you. Thanks, James. Um, hard to know what to say other than wow. That was a powerful talk and Q&A. Uh, your recognition as one of Canada's most powerful women is not just deserved, but a testament to your empathetic, compassionate approach and outlook. Your ongoing fight for equitable treatment in healthcare is inspiring to people like me and to people everywhere. And perhaps this is more important now than ever. As a medical ethicist, your presentation struck me as a profound statement on a critical set of issues that are not only timely, but critical to the welfare of those around us and those that we dedicate our lives to serve and to their well-being. You bring a personal touch to your work as a pediatrician and as someone who grew up with her own diagnoses, you're uniquely situated to provide care to children with neurodevelopment developmental disorders and from a deeply personal perspective, which is unique and, and valuable. You also saw an experience that having a parent in medicine allowed you to have access to better care than others at times, and you knew that needed to change. That all children, regardless of background or diagnosis, deserve equitable access just because they do. In a recent interview with KBHN, you noted that the air of medicine can be very ableist and that interact interactions that patients and their families have with primary care workers, even those workers' choice of words, will significantly shape the realities for those children and families. Too often, parents are told their child will never achieve this or will always struggle with that and by doing so, they come to internalize those ideas, those messages. You work to change that, to empower kids and their families and watch them reach their full potential. In fact, better equip them to reach their full potential. This is a rare quality and we're honored to have you as part of our KBHN community. So on behalf of Kids Brain Health Network, I have the great privilege of honoring you as the recipient of the 2021 Fraser Muster Award. Your dedication to your patients embodies Dr. Mustard's passion and mission. You not only follow in his footsteps, but you're carrying this important work forward and are contributing to it substantially. So thank you for all that you do. Thank you for all that you are. Thank you for the work you do with KBHN. We're excited to see how our shared partnership can continue and grow into the future. So once again, Dr. Church, congratulations. From all here at KBHN, we're very grateful for you, our partnerships, and all of your work on behalf of children. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, uh, and I think, Paige, I can, I can speak for the rest of the network when I say we absolutely endorse them and, uh, and uh, would repeat over and over again just, uh, just comments. And, and I want to say thank you on, uh, on a very practical level because uh, you have kept us on time. <laughs> Uh, and the worst, the worst thing that, that can happen uh, to the, the first chair of a session is that he puts the meeting, uh, he or she puts the meeting on uh, behind schedule, and we have not done that. Uh, we are perfectly on time, and I am happy now to turn the meeting back over to Jody to lead us towards the next session. Thank you very much. Okay, Dr. Church, come on. I listen, I got a couple of things to say. So I see we still have 25 seconds. But here's the thing, a few things that I wanted to take away, I just wanted to add real quick. Is that, you know, when we speak about bias in um, assisting our patients, when we care for the people who come, who 
with their, their lives, essentially, you can't address what you don't acknowledge. And being very aware of the fact that we all carry biases into the work that we do becomes the critical first step. And I and I've really noticed this, you know, as we speak about our indigenous peoples in this country over the last particularly six months, how we speak about even addressing with each other. You know, how do we feel? Are we biased about this when we step outside of those humongous uh, oppressive norms around, you know, um, straight, white, able bodied? What does that look like when we um, step into those with those biases and, and how much do they really you know shape the way that we present ourselves? And I think one of the things I often keep this Parker Palmer quote, he said this, he said, the human soul does not want to be fixed or advised, fixed or saved. It merely wants to be witnessed. And I think so in this desire to help people that we forget this idea that we just want to see you for who you are. We love, we come to, you know, our physicians or our practitioners to get the answer, but really at the end of the day, you have people who receive information when they feel seen and witnessed and heard. And how do we do that? I mean, your presentation just embodied all of that uh, and, and such a worthy recipient of, of this holy award. And, and for me, uh, Paige, representation matters. And I, I can't imagine how many people you've inspired in your career to watch you do such incredible things. So, so it's an honor to sit with you today. Um, and yes, indeed, we are on time. This is the funnest part so far for me. Uh, and now what I'd like to do is just take a five minute transition. I think it's important when we heavy things really, really take some moment as background. And I'll tell you, it's important right now to, to shake it off, to get up. We're going to take five minutes to do that. I want you to grab a coffee and not just scroll your emails, but really, I think, you know, as, as Paige sort of implored us to do, really get back into our own bodies. Just take a moment, drop your shoulders, uh, because I, then we're going to step into the lightning talks, which you need to prepare your heart for, because I can just tell you it's going to be amazing. So what you'll do is take a break now from us. And then when you're ready to step back in, in five minutes, we'll go, I think, right on time at 1140 Eastern is to um, click the link that says Trainee Lightning Talks 1 tab in Feedloop. So we'll see you back here in a few minutes. <laughs> 